Okay, introduction to Emmanuel Levinas. I'm going to talk about two things. Number one, um, post Holocaust epoch. And number two, biography. And then, sorry, number three, his thought. Uh, and then we'll look at two components of that. We'll look at the problem of the eclipse, or just, let me just write, the eclipse of God, um, and B, we'll look at ethics as the path to God. Okay, so that's the plan for today. Good. <clears throat> okay, so we are now, we're still in, kind of in the time of Marcel, um, a little later, Marcel was World War I, this is World War II. Um, the story of Levinas is much more tragic than Marcel's. Um, it's still a, a kind of um, philosophy marked by what we call um, PTSD, right? This is still people who have been through the war, and you'll see similarities between the way that Levinas writes and the way Marcel writes. You can sense the, the trauma in their writing, right? You can sense that these, these are two men struggling to, you know, kind of extract meaning from a broken world, right? In, in both cases, right? The world is broken. Um, there is a, a general sense of hopelessness, a general sense of despair. And both men, both Marcel and Levin, as you can sense, are, are struggling, right, to wrest meaning uh, out of this um, um, massive... <laughs> destruction right so very similar in the way they write you will you can also notice the kind of trauma in the writing and we'll talk about that in a bit so with Levinas we are in the post holocaust context this is right after the holocaust when I talk about Levinas's biography you will see that uh, what he endured right during the holocaust but we are now at a time where um, everything that Europe thought it was <laughs> has been dismantled by this, this reality, right? Europe thought it was civilized. Europe thought it was progressive. It thought it was going into an era of progress and everything, right? After the Holocaust, after this um, genocide, right? Of 6 million Jews and others, um, the Europeans are faced with their own barbaric actions, right? So the whole their whole vision of themselves comes tumbling down in a way, right? So in addition to their vision of themselves, their concept of God, right, is, 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 is completely dismantled by, by this event. So let's talk about that a little bit, right? So traditionally, the concept of God, I'm sure you've all heard this, God is a being who is both omnipotent, right? This, is, this means all-powerful and all-loving, right? So we have this belief that God, to be God, right, <laughs> must be both all-powerful and all-loving. You can't have a, a God who is not all-powerful. And you can't have the concept of God, at least in the Judeo-Christian tradition, who is not all-loving. When the Holocaust arrives on the scene, this concept becomes fractured. Let me explain. In other words, after the Holocaust, it is very difficult to envision that God is both all-powerful and both all-knowing, right? Because if he was all-powerful, he would have stopped it, right? So either he is not all-powerful, right? Meaning he couldn't stop it, or somehow he relinquished his power to stop it, or he's not all-loving and he's not who we thought he was, right? So you have a kind of fracture of the concept of God during this time. People are basically the question, right, that is burning on everybody's lips after the Holocaust in 1945 is, where was God, right? And this is precisely the question that Levinas will try to answer in his philosophy, right? Where was God? Um, and if he was around, who is he? Because he's not who we thought, he, right, he was. We imagine God as all-loving, protecting his people, intervening in history, right? Keeping his side of the covenant. This is in the context of Judaism, right? We know that God made a covenant with the Jews, right? If you follow my commands, I will give you fertility, protection, life, wealth. And now we have these Jews who followed their part, did their part, right? You're familiar that most of the Jews that were killed in the Holocaust were religious Jews, right? They were doing their part. And God doesn't fulfill his end, right? 
So completely dismantling of the concept of God. So make sure you write this down, right? The two burning questions after the Holocaust with regards to the concept of God or God, right? Is where was God? And if he was around, who is he? Right? These are the two main questions that Levinas is going to try to respond to, right? Um, in many ways, right? After the Holocaust, this, the, the, the familiar idea we had of God has died, right? In, in many ways, Nietzsche was right, right when he predicted God is dead, right? This is one of the famous quotes by Nietzsche, right? God is dead, the sea, the open sea lies before us. Uh, and in many ways, right, the traditional concept representation of God, right, has died um, after the Holocaust. Um, there's a poignant story told by Elie Wiesel about this particular death of God. <laughs> if you're familiar with Elie Wiesel, he was an Auschwitz survivor. He, he, was from, he lived in New York many years, wrote a number of books. The most famous one is The Night, which you should all read. This is a short autobiography of his time during uh, the Holocaust, how he survived the camp and so forth. Um, so he tells this story, I think it's in that book, The Night. Um, so he is, of course, in one of the concentration camps, one of the most uh, cruel ones. This is Auschwitz. And he's standing there every morning. There was a kind of ritual where everybody would be gathered in the center of the camp and whoever had trespassed during the night would be hung right, publicly hung, whoever had stolen something, tried to escape, whatever, they would be brought and hung in front of everybody else, right, and so Elie Wiesel remembers that that particular morning, it was two men and a child who were being hung in front of everybody, right, and, you know, he, they're all standing there watching this, they have to, and because, uh, so they hang them, but because the child is very light, he's very small, he takes a long time to die, right? He, if you're familiar with hanging, you, it's your body weight that creates the asphyxiation. So if you're too light, you don't die quickly, right? So this child is struggling for almost half hour between life and death, right? And Elie remembers hearing behind him a voice asking, where is God, right? And at that moment, he hears the answer within himself, right? There he is in that child between life and death, right? God is that child. Right now, God is about to die, right? This, this whole Holocaust, this whole genocide is bringing about in the European continent the death of God, right? So it's a very powerful intuition that he had, um, which in many ways... Um, Levinas will be addressing, right? Where was God? Is God dead? <laughs> Have we killed him, <laughs> right? So that's just to give you now, you're a little bit in the atmosphere, right, of the time. Uh, and we're about to meet Levinas, but you have to know this background because Levinas will be really addressing this question, right? Okay, so just a few words on Levinas, his biography. He was born in 1906. I believe he died. I keep on forgetting if he died in 95, 96, 94, somewhere in the 90s. <laughs> um, uh, I'll put a question mark. <laughs> but after 93, it was either 96 or I'm not sure, something like that. Anyways, he was born in Lithuania. Um, so this is one of the ex-Soviet countries, right? This is right next to the Soviet Union. One of the countries that, you, well, Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore, but right next to Russia, right? It was part of the Soviet Union at the time. So, um, so he's, uh, his family is, is from there. Of course, the Ukraine, like the rest of Russia or Soviet Union, there's a lot of anti-Semitism and you have a lot of violence, right? Perpetrated against the Jewish community. So the family moves to the Ukraine, which is also one of the countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union same thing happens, so they move back. So they're kind of moving back and forth. In the meantime, Levinas is educated in very good schools, right? He's part of the Jews over there in, 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 the, in the Soviet Union were actually very assimilated, at least those Jews <laughs> right, that Levinas is a part of. So they were completely assimilated. They went to you know, normal public schools. Uh, Levinas was fluent in Russian, in German, in French, right? So he's very well educated. He's part of, you know, he's a kind of a man of the world, right? He's not just strictly Jewish. He's also educated in Judaism, so he knows also very well the biblical text and the commentaries and so forth. 
anyways, in um, 1923, he's about 17. He, you know, because the anti-Semitism really is making things more and more impossible for Jews in the Soviet Union, he moves to France, right? If you recall, France is a secular country. Uh, religion is not, right, uh, one of the main contributions of the French, <laughs> right, is to create a, a country, right, that's their vision, <laughs> where religion is never going to be an issue, <laughs> right, is never going to be a cause for discrimination, right, this is one of the ideals of the French Republic, right, so they push it a little too much sometimes, but this is a good ideal, so he moves to France knowing that there, right, they are trying to be, you know, how you have colorblind and, and gender blind, they're religion blind, <laughs> right, they're trying to be um, oblivious to these kind of uh, distinctions because they want to create a society where everyone is equal. So he, go, he moves there, right? This is one of the reasons. He begins to study philosophy. He, he takes a little time in Germany also, comes back. And of course, in 1939, the war breaks out, right? Uh, by that time, he's already teaching, but, you know, strictly in Jewish high schools. He's not yet well known. He hasn't yet written anything special. Right, the war breaks out and he is enlisted uh, to fight against the Germans. Right, this is the war between France and between Germany and everybody else. <laughs> right, basically, this is when the Nazi came to power and so forth. Right, so, so he's he's enlisted in the war and shortly after he's captured by the Germans, and thankfully because he's an officer in the French army, he's not immediately sent to a concentration camp, even though he's Jewish. Right, he's sent to a separate camp with other officers who are also Jewish. And it was just a matter of time, but for now they are protected by the French uniform, right? So this is where Levinas begins to shape his philosophical thinking, right? And he, this is where he starts to write his first work, right? Um, kind of uh, scribbles it on, I think it was on, I can't remember, on different things he would find, he would scribble his thoughts. I think he would also send postcards you know, with his thoughts and, and kind of write in this way. So um, he tells a very interesting story, which is, I, I believe, the, the turning point in his philosophy and his way of thinking. And I'll tell you the story now because it will illustrate very nicely how, what is his main um, philosophical direction. So this camp, right, um, was more of a work camp. It wasn't a death camp. It was a work camp. So every day they would be herded off to work, <laughs> right, on different, I don't know, railroad tracks, roads, or, and so forth. And so he, this camp is, is situated um, in the countryside, right? So each time they would go out, they would encounter villages, right? And they would walk through the villages, and they noticed something very... Um, uh, uncanny, right? Each time they would walk through the villages, the villagers would kind of not look at them, right? They would walk through and the villagers would kind of like turn their gaze or not kind of look around, look on the ground, right? Ignore them, not want to really see what's happening, right? Refusing to see these imprisoned men, right? And so after a while, it started to get heavy, <laughs> the situation, right? They, he writes about it, right? And he talks about how after a while, it's very dehumanizing not to be acknowledged by fellow human beings, right? And this became heavier and heavier, the way that they would just kind of like shut him out, right? Ignore the plight, kind of refuse to see it. So one day, they come back from work and the camp door is, or gate is kind of open. And in walks a stray dog, <laughs> right? And you know how dogs are if you're a dog lover. Dogs love everybody. <laughs> so this dog is running up to the prisoners and he's jumping around and he's all happy. And he's like, hey, I'm here. Hi, let's play, you know. Really acknowledging them, right? In a way that the villagers had not been capable of for such a long time. And Levinas realizes in a heartbreaking moment that this dog is the only creature left that still sees him as human, as a human being, right? All the human beings around the camp in the villages have completely negated this. The dog is the only being left to acknowledge him as a man, right? As a human being. And so as a joke, he calls the dog the last Kantian in Germany. And he's alluding here to the philosopher Immanuel Kant, right? Who wrote a very famous work on respect, of persons, right? He wrote about that, how to respect human beings. He had very humanistic philosophy. And he's saying, you know, in Germany now, 
there's only this dog <laughs> who still knows what a human being looks like and how to treat a human being like a human being, right? So, so this experience would deeply shift his mindset. And from that time on, his main theme will be the theme of the other or the stranger, right? And there's a reason why he focuses on this, right? The reason is simply the huge void in Western philosophy when it comes to the concept of the stranger. Let me explain. If you look at moral philosophy throughout European, right? European moral philosophy from Descartes, Hume, uh, who are these other guys? Kant, right? All, all these very famous moral philosophers that lived in Europe until the 20th century. You will notice one thing is missing from all of their writings. And this is the concept of the other. Most of these philosophers, when they talk about ethics, it's within what we call the social contract. So let me explain, right? Most of these philosophers talk about society as a society of neighbors, of citizens, right? And within that society, we have certain responsibilities towards each other, right? This is called social contract theory. This is the main framework of moral philosophy in, in, in Europe up until, until the 20th century. We are responsible for each other within the framework of the social contract. I am in this nation with you. I am in this city with you. You are my neighbor. You are a fellow citizen. Therefore, I must respect you. I must um, take care of you. I must protect you. Right? And this was absolutely working very well. Up, even during the Nazi era, if, if you're a German, I'm a German, well, we have each other's back, right? This is why the first thing Hitler had to do, very simple, to get rid of the Jews, first step he had to do was to disenfranchise them, make them not German. Jews were Germans for centuries. They had been living there even before some German, right? There, there's centuries and centuries of Jewish presence in Germany, right? So what he had to do so that people would turn against the Jews, right, was disenfranchise them, make them into non-citizen, have a huge propaganda apparatus meant to show that the Jew is not like us, right? Once the Jew is not a citizen, he's not one of us anymore, there's nothing left to protect him because the only moral obligation that Europeans had been taught is to protect the people that are part of this society. And now that Hitler has made the Jew an exclude, right, excluded them from the society, then why should I take care of them? By the way, in case we start to judge the Germans, same thing now. Why should I care about the people on the border, right? Why should I care about poverty over there in, in, the, in the African continent or in the Latin American continent or Asian continent? Why should I care about what's happening in Mexico? Why should I care about what's happening in El Salvador or the, the you know, lack of human rights over here? We think the same. Right? My only responsibility, we believe, is to Americans, <laughs> right? I pay taxes for, I don't have responsibility for these Mexicans, right? Or these people coming in from God knows where, <laughs> right? So we, we, we have this mentality even now, today. This is influenced by the philosophy of social contract, which is a European philosophy, which has come here, right? And we don't feel like we are responsible for the one who doesn't belong to the society. Why should I care for that person over there who's not part of my society? This is social contract theory. And what Levinas is saying is that we are responsible not only for each other in the social contract, but for any human being. There is a bigger social contract. There is the human family, not just the American or the French or the German family. There is the human family. And we are responsible for human beings in general. We are responsible not only for our own, but for the other, right? The one outside. We are also responsible for the stranger, right? Um, and this is where, by the way, from people like Levinas and others, right? He's not the only one speaking like this after the war. This is where we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which didn't exist before, <laughs> right? This is where it comes from. Right, this famous declaration that, you know, human in general, we have to protect, we have to intervene. If there is a genocide here, we have to go. If there is, a, 
you know, injustice here, we have to do something. But this universal declaration of human rights stemmed from thinkers like Levinas who were saying, we are not only responsible for citizens, fellow citizens, we are responsible for any human being, for the stranger, right? So this is really the main contribution of Levinas to Western philosophy, is this emphasis on the other, right? Okay. Now, when it comes to what we are doing, right, philosophy of religion, let me say a few words about that, and then we'll go into um, a few words on the text. Okay. <clears throat> All right. When it comes to the philosophy, uh, anyway, so any questions so far before I continue? Just wondering. <clears throat> Anybody need a clarification before I continue? Okay, great. <clears throat> All right. So, um, when we narrow down Levinas's thought to um, philosophy of religion, which he has also influenced, you can see how he influenced ethics and moral and political philosophy, right? This is really his main idea, but he has also influenced the philosophy of religion. Um, and we will see that for him, uh, and he's, he, they're really going against a, a huge trend in, in, in uh, religious thinking in Europe, which is the idea that you cannot truly be spiritual, according to Levinas, unless you're also, also ethical. Okay, let me write this down, because this is the core of his thought, right? You cannot be truly spiritual unless you are also ethical. In other words, you can't be, see yourself as civilized and noble and cultured and spiritual if, you, if your relationships are not priority in your life right in other words this vertical relationship with god does is not is not complete to truly encounter god you have to encounter your neighbor right that's really one of the main uh, uh ideas in living us right to truly encounter god we have to encounter the neighbor now let me uh, emphasize why he's he's making this point right we know that in germany during the Nazi era, there was a pact between the churches and Hitler, right? Uh, and, and the churches, not only Catholic, but also a reformed Protestant, right? All told Hitler, and this is real, <laughs> I'm not kidding. They made a pact saying, we, we'll, we'll turn a blind eye, but just let us continue to assemble, right? Give us the freedom to be a church, to assemble, and we'll turn a blind eye, we won't make trouble for you, even though we know what you're doing, right? Uh, and so this was a pact, right? And so people kind of, you know, there was this idea that you could be a good Christian, right? And ignore <laughs> what was going on around you, right? This is still a trend today. Many Christians are apolitical, right? I can be a good Christian and, you know, you're, you're dying over here in poverty, but, you know, as a good Christian, that's not my... my my problem right so this was kind of a, 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 a this this was a trend in germany that you could actually be a believer uh, without necessarily having to care for the others because what really mattered was your relationship with god and the hymns you sang in church and the sermons you listened to and that's what made you a good christian right so there was so the, the this this pact right that existed between the churches and the nazi regime is really what levinas is responding to as we'll see in his philosophy, when he says that you can't be truly spiritual if you're oblivious to what's happening around you, right? One of the main churches that survived this was the, the church of Dietrich, uh, which didn't do this pact, right? It was the church of Dietrich uh, Bonhoeffer, right? And he, of course, if you're familiar with him, uh, he ended up being killed by the Nazis, right? He, there, were, there were a few churches that refused to bend, right? Uh, and immediately their leaders were imprisoned or assassinated, right? But, you know, the majority of churches in Germany at the time believe that, you know, as long as we can assemble, we're good, <laughs> right? We can turn a blind eye to what's going on and still be Christians. And so Levinas is, is really responding to this, right? Anyways, so let's go now and more precisely into the, the text we're about to read, which is called Enigma and Phenomenon. Right, which is found in the book I sign, Basic Philosophical Writings. So this text, I'm going to explain a little bit today so that when you read it, you have a little bit of a navigation tools. <laughs> Otherwise, if you thought Marcel was hard, this is worse. <laughs> right? 
This is much harder than Marcel. Um, so I give you a little bit of uh, tools so that you can find yourself in that text. Okay. So let's look first at the first issue Levinas is talking about here, which I have called the Eclipse of God. Okay, so this is um, this expression, Eclipse of God, is actually taken from the philosopher Martin Buber, who wrote a whole book about it, but it summarizes well what Levinas, what Levinas is talking about. This is, the Eclipse of God is, you know, an eclipse, of course, is when, uh, let me get this right, <laughs> Which one? When one planet passes in front of the other and eclipses it, hides it, right? Um, I forget, yeah, there's different eclipses, but this is what is happening. <laughs> and so you have this moment of darkness, right? And then it becomes bright again. So eclipse of God is genuinely the right term to describe, right? This, this era during the Nazi regime where there was really just evil seemed to have overtaken the European continent, right? Even the churches were making pacts with the devil, right? I mean, even the churches were in it. Uh, and we know now, even the Vatican, right? There's been documents have come out now that even the Vatican was kind of in alliance, right? With, uh, with Hitler. So there was a complete darkness, right? In terms, even the moral authority, the, ch the Christian church, right? Was silent, right? So, and the philosophers, of course. <laughs> We're the first to go, <laughs> right? So, and political, right? The framework of laws, institutions, nothing were strong enough to hold up against the tide of evil that invaded Europe at the time. And so you really had a period of unprecedented darkness, right, on the continent. And so, and, and remember what I told you, right? People start to question, right? What's happening? Where is God, <laughs> right? Um, and they, they emerge, right, from, from the, the wreckage of the Holocaust with enormous, right, soul-wrenching questions about it, where is God, if he's there, who is he, do I still believe in him, do I, can I believe, should I, um, right? And, and, and so Levinas is going to say, what's interesting, right, what Levinas is going to argue in this first section of, his, of, of the text we're going to read is that this doubt that people are having, these questions, these disturbing questions and and um, confusion, right, state of confusion, he says, this is good, right? This is actually a good state. Because for Levinas, doubt is one of the paths to God, right? We're going to look at that. And you sh it should remind you of someone else that we studied, actually. Who says that also, that questioning is a path to God? Do you remember in the people we studied so far? Somebody else said that. Same lineage as Levinas, by the way. Um, and Levinas is familiar with him. Who said that? That confusion, questions, asking yourself questions, having doubts, very good parody, right? Maimonides, same thing, right? Levinas is, is really in the lineage of Maimonides when he says, questions are good, doubt is good. These can be a path to God, right? Just like Maimonides said, right? We need to question. If we don't question, we're no better than the pagans over there, right? The questioning believer is closer than the unquestioning believer, right? Closer to the palace of the king, right? Okay, so we're gonna see that, right? This notion of, of doubt, positive notion of doubt, and so forth, we're gonna read about that. Um, and so, uh, so that will be for Levinas a possible path to God. So what he's doing is really embracing the spirit of the times, right? He's saying, we are all full of questions and confusion. I'm not gonna tell you stop being confused and have faith, right? He says that. I'm not going to tell you that. I'm not going to tell you to go back to how you used to think before the Holocaust. What I'm going to say is enter your questions, right? Enter your confusion because these can be a path that lead you to God. And we're going to see how that works in the text, right? Okay. Now, the second idea we're going to see in this is part B of the text is the notion of ethics as uh, a path to God, right? For Levinas, what we're going to see very quickly is that if God was anywhere during the Holocaust, it certainly was not as some omnipotent, all-powerful king seated on a throne looking over the universe, right? This idea of a powerful God who sees everything and can do all things, this is an idea we need to discard, according to Levinas. This doesn't work. It doesn't exist. This never existed, right? So he's really, right, for living as the only way to recover, to find, to catch a glimpse of God in this mess 
is to is to stop looking up <laughs> right this god doesn't exist anymore this god is dead right this notion of a god as powerful in heaven looking at us intervening right this is a for living us we were wrong <laughs> this is a faulty messed up perception or representation of who god is right for living us instead of looking up we should learn to look down right there's a beautiful uh, saying in orthodox christianity which really kind of struck me moved me very much is is the saying that god is humble right or god is poor this is something that you find only I, I haven't seen this saying outside of the christian orthodox church right which is the the russian christian or the greek christians right this is the kind of christianity there and and so but living us saying something similar to that don't look up if you want to find god look down look down among the people among the people who need you the most there that's where god is right in other words god is no more to be found in the heavens seated on a throne god on the contrary is to be found among the wretched of the earth that's where you need to turn your gaze if you want to connect to god again right jenakopoulos you have a question go ahead i wanted to talk on that uh, professor because i'm orthodox christian um greek orthodox and we say that because you know in uh, the bible uh god christ talks about oh if you helped a poor man right you helped me right if uh you help somebody when they need clothes or food or you, and you gave them drink you gave them food you know you helped me so like uh, god is all around us you know christ is with if it's within each and every person right so you saying that like really struck with me as well okay very good yes that's exactly right this is what what uh, jenakopoulos is saying is the christian equivalent right of what um uh, levinas is talking about Right, of course, Levinas is not going to talk about Jesus, but it's the same mindset, right? That God is to be found among the poor, among the wretched. We cannot find him anymore by looking up. That's what he said. After the Holocaust, this whole vision of God has been shattered. The only place we can look now is down, right? Among the poor, among the needy, among the wretched. This is where we need to dig to find God, right? And in as much as we connect to these people is connecting to God. So very similar idea to, of course, uh, Christianity in the way that Janakopoulos mentioned. Same thing. Um, um, there's a, uh, and of course you have in Christianity this idea, right? Um, but um, in Judaism, you also have this idea before leaving us. There's a beautiful story from the Talmud, right? Which remember is the commentary, the rabbinic commentaries on the Bible, right? huge work um, and in this text in the Talmud you have the story about the Messiah right so what is the Messiah Messiah is this kind of you know redeemer of the world right supposed to come and, and save us all create a new era right this is a, an idea of course very powerful in Christianity also right you have this um, idea that there's going to be a redeemer going to save everyone and this redeemer is a man of god or a man from god or even a man right who who is uh, almost partly divine you have this idea in the jewish tradition also right not just in christianity so there's a, a legend right that the messiah if you look for him when he arrives you shouldn't look in the city of jerusalem rather you should go outside among where the lepers live right the messiah will be found among the lepers let me explain among the lepers a leper at the time is a person stricken with a fatal skin disease right this was a very um uh very uh, uh how should i put it um disturbing disease because it ate up your whole body like the, the the infection would start to eat up at your fingers and and your limbs and you would end up with nothing right and little by little it would just eat you up it was it was horrible and it was also a disease where you couldn't very contagious so they so the lepers were as soon as they were diagnosed they were sent outside of the of jerusalem of the cities and they would live in colonies by themselves right around the city but never in the city and so this talmudic story is saying that when the messiah comes he will be found there among the lepers right a bandaging them 
right? He, uh, trying to help them. So again, another powerful image which goes along with what Levinas is about to teach, right? That God is, we have imagined him like this, but in fact, he's perhaps very different, right? Than what we imagined. Um, so we'll be talking about this, of course, uh, also in, in the, um, as we study this text. Okay, any questions so far before I conclude on uh, reading Levinas? All good? Okay. All right, so here's a few tips as you begin to read Levinas. Um, like I said, Levinas, honestly, for me, in my whole career, right, hardest philosopher out there. No one beats him. <laughs> There's no one, even Marcel, and no one beats him in terms of difficulty. So here's how you need to approach him. Um, Levinas, well, let me maybe tell you a little bit how I first encountered him. Maybe it will help. Okay, so when I was undergrad, um, I had to do a senior thesis. I went to my whatever professor and I said, oh, I want to do something on Jewish thought and existentialism. Who should I work on? And he said, oh, why don't you work on Levinas? I said, okay, I don't know who this is, but I'll, I'll look into it. So I checked out his big book, right? Um, Totality and Infinity, and it was Thanksgiving vacation. So I sat and read the book during Thanksgiving vacation. I came back and my professor was like, okay, it's, did you like it? I said, oh yeah, 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 I loved it. I loved it. I didn't understand a word, <laughs> but I loved it, right? And this is Levinas. With Levinas, it's poetry, right? He, he has a, a, an amazing way of writing, which is extremely poetic, extremely rich and dense. It's like entering a forest or entering a jungle, right? You immediately are, are kind of, you know, assaulted by all kinds of, you know, amazing creatures, <laughs> right? So, but at the same time, it's very hard to figure out what he's talking about, but you sense that there is something mysterious, something extremely important that if you can break through that mystery, you'll have solved all the secrets of the universe. At least that was my feeling, right? I didn't understand a word, but the beauty, the rhythm, and the mystery of the work is what attracted me to, to living us, right? So I want you to enter the text like this, right? Don't try to understand it. Forget that. <laughs> I'll do it in the lecture. I'll explain things, right? But as you're reading, I want you to read like you're entering a big jungle. When you enter the jungle, don't try to find your way. Don't try to cut down the trees. Right? Don't try to, don't be, don't be afraid. Just enter an experience, right? Just walk in and just let yourself be caught, caught up by the foliage, by the scents, by the smells, by the, you know, the, the breeze, whatever, right? That's how I want you to enter Levinas. Just enter and get caught up. Don't try to understand. Just go, go with the flow. It's like water, water, white water rafting right? Don't try to control it. Just go down, <laughs> right? So really, I want you to read him like that. Just try to really be in the presence of this author. Try to sense the mystery that he's getting at as he's writing. One of the ways to reconcile ourselves to Levinas's difficult writing is to, is to see this encounter with Levinas or with his writing as an encounter with otherness, right? And this is very important. You know Levinas is talking about the other. Very important concept. When he's writing, actually, he's actually putting you in contact with the other. Levinas is your other. And the other is not something you can control, understand, grasp, right? The other is simply someone you must experience, right? When you guys get married, you'll understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Can't control, grasp, understand your, your spouse, right? Just live with them. <laughs> Right. Um, and this is the same, right? Living as is writing, take it as an encounter with the other where you are not in control. You don't know what's happening. You're confused. And yet it's beautiful and amazing experience. Right. So <laughs> Karuchi agrees with me. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So really just try to go with it, encounter it, experience it. You don't understand it. This is on purpose. Right? He writes like this on purpose to, to really put you in the presence of otherness. Before you even read one word, you're already experiencing the other with Levinas. And that in itself is enough. How you react to Levinas is how you will react to the others in your life. So I'll be watching when I do the poll next time and I ask you if you liked him and, and I have a bunch of haters. Be careful. 
because the way you respond to Levinas is the way you will respond to the strangers and others of your life, right? If you immediately reject and have an allergy and are frustrated, that's how you'll be in your relationships, <laughs> right? So learn already now, how can I be in the presence of Levinas, of this other? Am I receptive? Am I welcoming? Am I, right? Or am I going to push back because I don't understand, right? Jenna Kopoulos, anything to add? <laughs> Yeah, I had a couple of stories I want to say really quick. But um, one time I was out at the gas station with my friend, you know, getting gas. And this lady came up to us and asked for money. And I was like, uh, you know, you know how you just like fend off. You're like, oh, I don't have any money, right? So my friend was like, yeah, we didn't have any money. And then as we drive off, he's like, you know, bro, that could have been a test. That could have been an angel from God, right? <laughs> and it's like true, you know, because that could have been an angel. We just failed that test, <laughs> you know? So that was one. And I remember when you were talking about the leper colonies, my bishop's grandfather, so this is like a long time ago, right? Um, he's 60, my, good, my bishop is 60, and his grandfather was from a long time ago, okay? They, they had these leper colonies, like you said, and he was a priest at these leper colonies. And so, you know, uh, we have the divine communion, holy communion every single Sunday, right? And especially on the feast and stuff. So this doctor went to the leper colony one day, and he's like, oh, you know, this priest, I suspect that he's not actually drinking from the same chalice. You know, he's not finishing the Holy Communion. So, you know, they had the service. The, the priest is giving uh, Holy Communion to everybody. And then afterwards, when service is done, he goes inside. He's going to finish the thing, the, the Holy Communion. So the doctor goes, peeks in, and he sees that he's actually drinking from the same exact cup and the same spoon that the lepers were having and leprosy if you guys don't know it's like it's a very contagious disease it's probably the most contagious disease in the world and the only reason that we got rid of it was because we had these leper colonies it's it's like even worse than um what's that uh the one that starts with an l i don't remember the disease it was called but it's like a throat it's like a throat disease super uh super contagious it's like even worse than that so that reminded me of that story and he never got sick by the way the priest never he once got crazy. sick. He got immune. Never <laughs> once got sick. Yeah. He got immune from drinking it was helping him. <laughs> very good. Yes, yeah. that illustrates very nicely, right? What what Levinas is trying to say. Absolutely, right. Very good. Any other comments before we continue? Um, or finish? <laughs> okay. Great. All right. Perfect. So. Um, so next time, which is uh, what is today? Monday. So on Wednesday. We'll be reading our first um, text by Divinas. Uh, let me, uh, should I continue the recording? Yeah, let me stop the recording so I can talk a little bit about your tests. <laughs> so I'm going to stop it now.